Jed, we are live. All right, I assume that means it's time to, for me to talk then. Uh, great. Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, it's exciting for us to have everybody here. Uh, so I was just thinking about COZAD, uh, the COZAD competition this year. This is our 21st COZAD competition. Uh, COZAD was started uh, in the year 2000 um, when Peter Fox got together with some friends and, and wanted to honor his mentor, uh, Del, V. Del COZAD and uh, give some funds to help launch the COZAD competition. And, and this year, it wasn't ideal. We had to stop the competition uh, due to the crisis that was going on, the pandemic. But we decided to keep it going and pull some, uh, pull some mentors and, and judges together and, and friends of the competition and, and help support the teams that wanted to keep going. And so we appreciate those that helped, uh, that are here tonight and those that helped support the teams throughout the, uh, the last four weeks. And so uh, it's been fun to see the uh, people rally together and help support teams. And it's fun to see that, you know, we have close to 30 teams that'll be pitching tonight. So again, we'd just like to thank everybody that, uh, that have helped and, and uh, helped push this along. And so it, it's, it's fun to look back on the competition and see, uh, or see this event and, and see all those that have uh, uh, been successful after going on as, uh, or participating in this as well. So again, it's good to see those uh, friends that have supported it over the years and just like to thank those that have, have done that. So we have a lot of uh, people participating tonight that have supported it throughout the year. So uh, just again, thank you so much. Uh, with that, we'll get started now. I don't want to take too much time. And, and also, let's like to thank uh, John and Harley and, and, and Catherine and Stephanie and the rest of the team that have helped put it on and put a lot of time into this. So with that, uh, I don't want to take much more time. We'll just get started here. Um, let's see, I have closed that document. Is What we're going to do now is, uh, Catherine, are you sharing the slides? We'll have uh, uh, brief introductions, just 30 seconds, 30 second introductions by our uh, mentors that are here tonight. And then we will split out into our breakout rooms. And just, I wanna remind teams that are presenting tonight that there's just five minutes of uh, presentations, and then there'll be five minutes of uh, Q and A by the uh, mentors and judges in the breakout rooms. So with that, uh, we'll get started by uh, 30 second introductions by each of our uh, uh, mentors and judges tonight. I believe you got the slides, Catherine. Great. All right, Joe. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Joe Beatty, um, an alum from engineering long ago. Grew up in the telecom business, did a startup there that went public. Ran a couple tech companies after that. Um, and these days I invest in startups in Chicago and advise them as well. Great to be here. Thanks, Joe. All right. Catherine, next. Jackie. Is Jackie here? Jackie, I think, was going to be a little bit late. She is. So why don't we move on? Be a little late. Like, go ahead and, uh, and give her a brief introduction. And, and we can go a little longer. Feel free to take about a minute. OK, so Jackie is a, an alum from mechanical engineering, I believe. And uh, uh, she's vice president now at Hyde Park Venture Partners. And she participates on campus regularly, uh, speaking to students and mentoring them. And uh, has been very active on campus the last few years. And is uh, participated with us for uh, many years. So that's Jackie. And she'll be here shortly. Bess? Hi, everyone. I'm Bess. I'm a principal at Hyde Park Angels HPA. We're the most active investor in Chicago, Illinois area, um, and have some great portfolio companies like Four Kites, Catalytic, um, and so I've been really privileged to help support the Chicago tech ecosystem and looking forward to seeing your guys' presentations tonight. Great to have you here. Thank you. Alex? All righty. Um, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur and engineering consultant. Um, I've been the lead, en lead engineer on over 200 products and I've advised uh, thousands of startup teams. Uh, I tend to concentrate in ag tech and med tech. Excellent, good to have you here. Joe. Oh, we've got, Joe's here. Joe, so you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. <laughs> there we go, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm an alum from the ECE department from 
I don't know, 25 years ago. Um, started a uh, few companies. The latest company I've started is in uh, um, uh, building enterprise, very large scale, building a very large scale enterprise database that holds exabytes of data and runs machine learning on the world's largest data sets. I'm the uh, co-founder and the, currently the chief product officer for OSINT. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Joe. Marcin. Hey guys, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Marcin Kuczynski. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called Malwarebytes. Uh, we're about 850 people worldwide uh, fighting cybercrime on uh, for, for our users. Uh, I'm a CS alum out of, uh, out of the University of Illinois, of course, and uh, graduated in 2012. Not too long ago, I suppose. <laughs> Excellent. Great to have you here, Marcin. Andrew. Hey, everybody. Andrew Lucis. I'm an alum from the engineering department from, from a while back as well. Um, senior director at TechNexus. Um, we do a lot of early stage investing. We usually invest in partnership with a lot of our corporate partners, um, essentially doing their, their corporate venture capital with them. Guys like Brunswick Boating, Sure Audio, um, Pierce Manufacturing. We've done about 100 investments over the last two and a half years. Great. Good to have you. Thank you. Ed, uh, is Ed here? Ed was going to be a little bit late as well. So Ed, Ed Moore uh, is the founder of Biophia Consulting and does a lot of uh, med tech uh, consulting on campus. Uh, was at Baxter Medical for many years and is a strong supporter of our programs. And so uh, that's all I've got to say about Ed, but uh, uh, happy to have Ed here. Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Murphy. I'm a shareholder at Meyer Capel Law Firm here in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, we have about 35 lawyers between Champaign and Bloomington, and a, a number of us are involved in tech startups and have been for years in licensing things out from OTM, helping get companies up and running, whether it's their corporate structure, their licensing structure, um, all those sorts of things. And we have been participating as a firm in the COZAD asset or COZAD man, the COZAD competition since uh, since it started. And I look forward to hearing the pitches tonight. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Karen. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm Karen O'Connor and I'm very happy to be here. I'm based in Chicago and am a venture partner at Sarah Ventures which is headquartered in Champaign. We invest in early stage technology companies, many of which come out of the University of Illinois. Um, I'm also a proud graduate of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, my day job is teaching at Kellogg where I'm a clinical assistant professor on the entrepreneurship track. Excellent, good to have you, Karen. Scott. Hello everybody, um, Scott Rose, uh, 1987 graduate in computer engineering. Um, really excited to be here and see you all and see the deals, um, see what you've got. Um, I, uh, I started off uh, in the financial markets and um, have been doing that ever since. Uh, recently, I've been involved in angel investing and uh, with uh, Bess and uh, Hyde Park Angels. And so I've got investments in about 30 different companies. I'm active at the U of I uh, on the board of visitors for the College of Engineering and also at the Research Park. I'm on the, uh, the board there. So excited to be here and see your presentations. Thanks. Great. Good to have you. Mark. Hey, I'm Mark Tebbe. I am a professor at Day up at Booth. Uh, I teach entrepreneurship there. I also teach the New Venture Challenge. But better than that is I'm an alum from the CS Department of College of Engineering in 1983, active with a lot of things down at U of I, and thrilled to be with everyone tonight. Fantastic. That's great. Again, uh, thanks everyone for uh, being here tonight and taking time uh, to do this. So again, we'll have, uh, we're going to split up in breakout rooms now. And the, again, just to reiterate, there'll be five minute pitches and then five minute Q&A. Uh, from there. Catherine, is there anything else uh, people need to know? Um, I am going to send out the breakout room information. Uh, three quarters of the groups will be going into breakout rooms and one quarter will be staying in the main session with me. Um, when that happens, I'm going to do just a quick roll call with the group that are going to be in my room uh, or in the main room, if you will. And if there's anybody who doesn't belong there, I will put you in the right room. 
Um, I'm seeing a lot of names that um, maybe you may be here on somebody else's behalf to present, um, and I'm not quite sure which uh, team you're with. So we'll, we'll just go through that real quick if you don't get broken out into the right group, um, and we will find the right spot for you. So um, with that, um, mentors, um, I'm sorry, facilitators, are you all ready? Harley, John, Jed, Stephanie? We are. Um, excellent. Okay. Um, well, here we go. This is a little bit of a slow process. So uh, please forgive me. There are a couple of folks that I just need to put into rooms. I'm gonna pause sharing for a moment. Back this up. All right, so. Um, Catherine, sorry to interrupt. I just, I was put in the wrong room. So no. I'm going back to a different room. Sorry about that. Okay. Stephanie, which room do you need to be in? Room number two. Sure, happy to put you there. There you go. Bye. <laughs> Zoom is exciting. There's so many different things you can do with it. And it's also, uh, it means there's a lot of different things that need to be done. So thank you all for your patience while we do this. And almost there. Last one. Here we are. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen now. Um, and on it are four different teams. I'm sorry, seven different teams. If your team is not on this list, please let me know. And thank you all for those who are supposed to be in this room. I really appreciate your patience while I do this. It's just a uh, facilitating uh, aspect to this that just has to get done. Is there anybody here who does not see their team on this list? Uh, I think I'm in the wrong breakout room. Um, okay. What team are you? I'm with Swim Shark Tech with Raj. Yes, you are. Oh, pardon me. I'm not sure if I'm in the lobby or a breakout room. It never gave me an option to. There you go. I, I, I thought I'm in the wrong room. And what team are you? Free title. If you can send me a text uh, or a, excuse me, a chat, I will, I'll put you in the right room. Anybody else? Last call. Um, I'm part of Woodlock. I don't think I'm supposed to be in this room. Okay, if you go ahead and send me a chat, I will put you in the right room. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else needs to send me a chat to put me, uh, I'll put you in the right room and we're gonna go ahead and get started on this one. Um, so equitability um, is going to be first. So do I hit the record here button, Catherine, or are you? It's already um, recording. We are already recording. Cool. Um, so that makes this room a little easier, <laughs> which is great. Um, I love it. Just to remind, uh, yeah, if I, you, anything else or can I kick it off here? No, please go right ahead, John. Okay. Please. So I just remind judges and uh, peers in the room, you have evaluation forms. Uh, there'll be five minute presentations. I got my little stopwatch here on my phone um, and uh, try, try not to run over. Um, so we have seven teams. So we'll need to kind of stay on schedule here if at all possible. And then you'll have five minutes, just a reminder, you'll have five minutes of questions. After the fourth team, we'll take a short break. Um, and, and judges, feel free to manage your time any way you'd like. Part of it is free to um, ask questions. Part of it's free to give advice. 
Um, we'll probably leave one minute at the end here so you can fill out your forms um, and then we'll go on to the next team. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and get my timer started. And first team up is equitability, equi equi I can't say it, equability. And anytime you're ready, go. Uh, equability, who do we have here from equability? Hi, my name is Hillary. Um, how do I control the slack? I just gave you access. So if you click on the screen, um, you should be able to access. All right, when you start talking, I'll hit the timer. Um, one second. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Hillary Pham. And I'd like to start off by introducing Ku Tom Nunez, whose name is Cyborg. Um, he's a former Pan American Taekwondo champion and a PE teacher. When he was 29, he got into a motorcycle accident and needed to have both his legs amputated. After recovering and getting what he likes to call his new body configurations, dressing and buying clothes became a lot more challenging. He tried buying adaptive clothes, but the selection was limited, the clothes were ugly, and made him feel like he was still wearing hospital apparel. Instead, he now almost exclusively wears athletic clothes since they're easy to wear, but stand out in most social situations. And Kluton isn't alone. From our survey of about 45 individuals with disabilities, 90% said that they didn't buy an article of clothing because it was too difficult to wear, and at least 50% asked someone to help them put on or take off their clothes. We've also found a lot of academic research validating this problem. There are two studies from the University of Missouri linking the lack of professional clothing to social and professional barriers. In one of the studies, a participant said that he couldn't attend his brother's wedding because of a lack of apparel. And, um, sorry, this slide. And this issue is not very new. The adaptive clothing market is huge, but has been largely left out of the mainstream conversation. In terms of the dressable market, in the US, about 20% of individuals have some sort of disability, whether it's physical, cognitive, or mental. Of that group, there are about 20 million people with dexterity or mobility issues. In 2020, the global adaptive clothing market is worth 290 billion with a D dollars, and the US market makes up about 45 billion. So after learning about this issue, my venture, Equability, began because we want to build an inclusive world where everyone can wear what they want, and we'll do so by giving people the ability to conveniently modify their clothes and adapt them to their needs. Equability is a clothing modification service, and it focuses on the challenging functional features of clothes, such as buttons or zippers. It will not change the design or size of the clothes, and it will focus on people with dexterity or mobility issues, so individuals with arthritis, um, MS, and it would modify the clothes using existing technology such as Velcro, magnets, and snap buttons. So here are some images and videos of our functional prototypes. They both show modifications to button up shirts with magnetic buttons on the left and Velcro on the right. And the goal of the modifications is for the clothes to look exactly the same as something you could buy from a retail store, but be adapted for the individual. Equability has two revenue streams, a B2C side, which would charge a fixed price so that no one's disability would cost more than another person's, and customers would ship their clothes to us, we would modify them and send them back. On the B2B side, we would charge the company a fixed price or a percentage of the apparel's price. Customers would buy their clothes from the retailer, the company would send it to us, and we would ship it back to the customer directly or back to the store for in-store pickup. From our analysis, we've been estimated about $120,000 to buy all the materials and equipment to sustain the first year of operation. In terms of the competitive environment, we have low end clothing retailers that don't offer adaptive clothing options, but have a wide variety. There are high end retailers that um, do offer some adaptive clothing lines like Tommy Hilfiger. So they do have variety and they have accessible options, but they're very expensive and existing solutions that sell adaptive clothes, um, they focus more on the function and are not fashionable at all and are also very expensive. The main issue that's left out of all of these existing solutions is social integration. People with disabilities have to shop in limited sections and are still being treated as other in the existing solution space. Equability would offer variety, accessible options and create a seamless buying experience so that people with disabilities don't have to be burdened or excluded because of their disability. At this moment, I'm looking for partners with fashion industry, finance or accounting, and sewing experience. I'm also looking for mentors and any advice for moving forward with this project, especially in a post-COVID-19 world.
And finally, I'd like to end with EcoAbility's mission statement, which is change clothes so people don't have to. We want to modify clothes so that people with disabilities don't have to change their lifestyle or clothing styles because of their disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. So um, now we were going to uh, turn it over to our mentors um, who are going to give a little bit of feedback. I think they're just wrapping up their thoughts right now. Um, and then they will provide some of that feedback to you, do a little Q&A, um, and then we will move on to the next person. But in the meantime, I'll leave this slide up and let you guys have a conversation. Hillary, can you talk, this is Joe speaking, can you talk a little bit about the economics of how much it taught uh, cost to modify a piece of clothing? Sure. So the main driver of the cost for any of these modifications is the labor. Um, with the exclusion of the magnetic buttons, in terms of Velcro or any of the snap buttons, um, the cost of the actual piece itself is pretty negligible. It's about five or 10 cents um, per like square inch of Velcro. Um, so the main driver of a cost would be buying the um, equipment, having the space to actually have people make the modifications and then the labor costs of training um, and having people spend time to actually make those modifications. And what, how much time does it take to make a modification? So in, for the entire process with shipping and everything, we predicted it would be about seven to 10 days. So about three to four days to ship it to us, three to four days to ship it out. And the actual time that it takes to make the modification would be less than 30 minutes for sure, depending on um, how backed up the uh, production is. A lot of the changes are going to be very easy to make. So in terms of the magnetic buttons, there are commercially available options that you just pop on the buttons and you maybe sew in one or two things per button. So it is very, um, very easy fixes and very um, time, not time consuming um, changes to make. And in terms of the velcro and the snap buttons, they would also be just sewing, um, I guess, additions onto the pieces. So it should take less than 30 minutes per alteration and that's including the process time. And how much do you plan to charge per piece to do this? So we are hoping to do a fixed price. We were thinking of um, 15 to $20, including shipping costs, um, just because we want to make sure that no one's disability um, would be more expensive or cheaper than someone else's. So we want to do um, like a $15 fixed cost no matter what modification. So even though some of the modifications would be more expensive, such as the magnetic buttons versus Velcro, um, we want it to be a fixed 15 or $20 cost. And you Hillary, this is, oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead, Mark. Hillary, this is Mark Tevy. I have a question on, I'm assuming when someone has a disability such as this, not all disabilities are the same. So while you're at it, you're gonna be doing a little tailoring. How are you gonna know what modifications this particular this, this person's particular disability will require to determine should the Velcro be done in a different manner than the other shirt? Should the magnetic buttons be done in you know only halfway down? Those type of questions that are very particular to a particular individual. Yes. So for our initial phase of rollout, we were thinking of offering um, on our website just a menu of options. So people could choose um, what kind of shirt, what kind of material it would be to even see if we could offer the modifications. And then they would choose from a, a range and a menu of options. So it would be magnetic buttons and there would be a note section that um, would add additional comments. Or if they wanted Velcro, they would choose from a drop down menu. Instead of magnetic buttons, they would choose the Velcro. So to roll out initially, we wanted to standardize it as much as possible. So we would at first offer only a selective menu of options. Eventually in the three to five year expansion, we do want to have physical stores where we can do more in-depth tailoring and more in-depth altering because um, we'd have to actually physically measure people. And um, our service is to help people, even if they're living alone and have dexterity issues, they wouldn't be able to measure themselves. Um, so we figured starting out and rolling out with a, with a standard menu of options first and then um, doing more closely tailored options in the future um, is our plan at this moment. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's Marcin here. Really, uh, really cool idea. Um, just quick question on the transaction. So presumably this, you know, there's going to be a website. I go on there. I, I uh, you said there's, you know, I pick, pick a couple of options, put some notes in. Do I then send the, the uh, item to you or do you send me a shipping container that I could put that in? Like what's the transaction look like? 
Sure. Um, so a lot of, uh, I guess, um, the clothing apps right now, so such as Poshmark or Mercari, the way that they're doing it, you can choose from an option of shipping um, menu options, I guess. So you can either ship uh, from your own home. So you could print out the label, box it yourself, um, package it up, and then drop it off at a USPS store or a FedEx store. Or there's also options where USPS would come and pick it up from your, um, your porch, or you can go in store and just drop it off and they'll package it up for you. So based, because we would be helping people with a range of disabilities and some people might not be able to package it, we want to offer that variety of um, packaging uh, services. So it could range from they do it themselves and they have their own box at home. If they have an empty Amazon box, they could just ship the uh, print the label and ship it themselves, or they could go to a store and drop it off, or they can have it pick up in their porch if they can't leave their home easily. So we are looking at a wide range of um, shipping models to follow. Hillary, great job. Really appreciate it. Judges, if you take one minute here to go ahead and add any last minute comments here, and we'll move on to the next team. Thank you. Nice job, Hillary. And John, uh, you want us to uh, fill out that um, that uh, survey, right? Yeah, if you could. Perfect. Thanks. We'll give you one minute. Hopefully, it won't take too long. And then we'll move to the next team. Catherine, is it possible you can put put up the next so pot of paw? So get ready, please. So am I going to have control of this screen? Yes. Okay. Just give it one second so I can. Um, okay. Just a heads up for the students pitching. There was about a three second lag when you hit um, to go to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, I, I, I realized. <laughs> Okay, judges, are you ready? Anybody need more time or can we move along here? Kind of hearing nothing. Good, good. Marcin, are you good? Yep. All right, Joe? I'm good. Okay, Paw to Paw, you're up. Um, hi, I'm Zikram from Paw to Paw. Um, we are a platform that connects potential pet buyers to breeders. Uh, so it's like an eBay for pet adoption for pure breed. So just to, oh, sorry. Just to give you a sense of what current purchasing process for pure breed is like, uh, I'm gonna show you or share my own experience of buying two cats uh, from a breeder. So I currently have two breeders short here. They're all kittens. Um, before I got my first baby, I have been searching for a pets for about more than six months. And I reached to reach out to more than 30 breeders and only three of them replies to me. The first one disappeared after the first reply. The second one is from South Carolina and she asked me to pay $600 deposit through PayPal with family and friends option with no legal binding contract. So I think that might be a scam. So the third one is actually a one that um, I buy it from. So it's, I'm pretty lucky that my breeder is from Chicago. So I get to um, see, see the cats, touch it um, and go through the contract before I actually pay for anything. Um, so many of my friends is not as lucky as I am. Like Sherry, for example, she has to pay $500 deposit before she sees her cats with no contract through PayPal with option family and friends. And after talking to a more than 60 pets owner, we realized that it is very common procedure that people go through uh, when they're buying uh, pure breeds cats or dogs from breeders. So it is clear that potential pet buyers were being vulnerable to online scams due to the intransparent and insecure process. So Polypol is here to offer a platform that solved this issue by offering uh, a secure pet purchasing process. So just to give you a sense of the size of the market. Uh, so every year though, there is 4 million pure breed pets being purchased and about $500 uh, and each purchase costs about an uh, average of $500. It ranges from 1,000 to 5,000. We're being conservative here. We take $500, uh, which adds up to $2 billion every year uh, that is spent on pure breed purchasing in the US alone. And in the breeder side, there's 
34,000 breeders currently in the US. We segment it into two categories. The first one is professional breeders, which includes breeders that constantly go into different cat shows, dog shows, or breeding uh, cats and dogs as their full-time job. And for family, and the other category is family-run breeders, uh, in which we're talking about breeder that is retired, that has uh, less leader per year, uh, but they're still breeding and can are able to provide a pedigree documenting uh, for their buyers. And the and the um, and the breeders that we're going after first uh, will be the family-run breeders because they are the people that have problems uh, looking for potential pet buyers. So here is a very simple sneak peek of our uh, financial projection. So um, our main source of revenue is transactional cut uh, for each purchase that is made in our platform. And we are also looking into opportunities uh, of providing post purchase pet service subscriptions as a source of revenue in the future, because we know that um, transactional cuts might not be a long run, long time, might not be a sustainable uh, revenue source that can keep our uh, customer in, in our platform. So um, you can see that uh, after we calculate all the revenue, operation costs and uh, marketing, uh, we are going to, we're looking to break equal by year of 2023. And we are looking to reach um, 8 million by the years of 2025. So our current group are consists of three people. Uh, we, we have two um, software developer who working on developing a website, Android app and iOS app for this platform. We also have a business development uh, who is a student from University, University of Chicago who is working on um, the business side of things. So uh, it's obvious that we are still need more um, sources or no more helps on the business development side. So uh, we are currently looking for members um, or mentors who have experience with uh, business development. And that's it for me. Now I welcome okay. questions. Great job, so I can Judges, please, any questions? Hey, uh, it's, oh, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Marcin. Okay, I'll go first this time since you went first last time. Sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, Great to meet you and, and great presentation. So uh, out of curiosity, why, why focus on just the purebred market? Is there uh, an opportunity to go after just uh, even adoption? Um, it just makes the market a little bit bigger in my opinion, out of, out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. So uh, shelter, adopting from shelter, we, we usually see it as we, we are not trying to make a profit out of something that is, um, that is in the shelter. And there's a very saturated market that's for, for shelter adoption because they have a very, and we are also looking into providing a shelter adoption free listing just as also, uh, just as pure breed in our platform. But we are only cutting um, transactional cuts uh, in this in this platform. And shelter, there's something uh, with the shelter is that shelter, you have to go see the pets. They don't ship cat, uh, cats or dogs. So I realized that and, and oh, in addition to that, um, the reason why we're going after pure breed is that uh, a lot of my friends and a lot of customer that we interviewed uh, get pure breed from, pup, uh, from like, a, there's something called pet agency uh, that they import pets from Europe and they're usually from puppy meals and cat meals. And we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to build a platform so that people that is actually looking for a specific breed are able to um, find a, appropriate breeder instead of reaching out to like puppy meals or cat meals. So yep. that is a reason why. Makes makes sense. Thank you. So, so I'll congratulate you on, I really thought every market on the internet was possibly taken and I've now found one that is not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, I have friends that have been through this process and it's a nightmare. It is an absolute nightmare process. Um, <laughs> and so I think you've stumbled on something here that is that is an excellent business idea. Um, how do you, um, so I, as my friends have been through this, you know, their, their process is very personalized where they meet the breeder and it's, 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 it's like joining a community. It's almost like adopting mm -hmm. a child is, is really yes. what it gets into. Um, so I, I view this as more like match.com for dogs is kind of what, what the way our cats is the way I see it. Mm -hmm. 
how is your transaction fee work on this? Are, are you going to, are you going to charge a subscription to the buyer? Are you going to charge on peer per transaction? How, how is the revenue model? Yeah, that would be, because I thought our slide can only be five page. So I limited, I cut out a lot of um, details, but I can definitely go through how uh, the unit economy and how, how would I come to the number of 500 and stuff like that. So every, um, so on average, after our research and talking to multiple breeders, uh, we know that the, the price of the cats or dogs range from $1,000 to, well, to a, a really astronomical number, but it's usually $1,000 to $5,000. So we take um, the average, which is we assume that it's every pet costs about $2,000. $2, and we cut 5% of the transaction that is performed in our platform, which is about $100. And it's charged on the breeder side because this is how the pets um, agency work right now is they charge the breeder side because the breeder is the one that is looking forward to sell their pets, to sell their cats and dogs to the potential um, buyers and we talk to multiple breeders and, and they think that is a reasonable amount uh, because it would definitely attract more um, pet buyers. So we also consider the buyer acquisition about $15, uh, 15 per, per buyers through Google ads and Instagram ads. And for breeder acquisition, we usually, after like talking to about 40 breeders, we realize that they prefer in-person communication. So we are looking into direct sales for breeder acquisition in which we are doing now. Um, so they are about $4 per breeder acquisition, which uh, give us a margin before operation of $81 per pass, so per, per purchase that is made. So uh, our projection is made on five years. It's a five-year projection. So it actually adds up to the numbers that you see here. So I can definitely get into more detail uh, if you're interested, but um, if it is a lot of number and, um, and, and we also calculate a credit card transaction fee, the operating fee, and that's basically it. And we, we haven't covered um, the post-purchase service subscription in this projection model because this is what we are looking into uh, because the reason COVID-19 we're looking into a slight pivot but this is not included in the projection and financials that we have now. So you don't have time John? Go ahead Mark you can you can go ahead. They could, uh, great presentation great discovery um, but in looking at it have you looked at any other uh, websites that might be able to serve in this function and how do you price and differentiate yourself from them? Things like Puppy Spot or Good Dog. Um, I think I, would you repeat the question? Because I have, are, is that a question about competitor? In which yeah, I mean, in looking briefly, you know, as I was getting ready for this, I, I looked at there because I thought it was a great idea, but mm -hmm. I see there's a couple sites like uh, Good Dog and Puppy Spot. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate from them? And how do, is it from pricing or is it from supply or is it from mm -hmm. uh, ease of use? What makes it different uh, from these other ones that are already out in the marketplace? So the current one only provides listing. So there's no, in the United States at least, there is no platform that provides secure transaction. So our main sell, the, the pain point that we're solving is for is for user, uh, potential pet buyer to avoid pet scam. This is something that we scare the most and we are going to do that through escrow. So it's a process that we Yes, it's, it's a lot of detail, it's a lot of step, and I think we're running out of time. So most yeah. of the platform right now only have listing and we are providing transaction. Okay. Thank you. All right, great job, Tyken. All right, judges, take one minute, finish your sheets up if you would, please, and we'll move along. Catherine, if you can advance the slide to the next team, that'd be great. Hey, Catherine, is my appendix on here? You know? I don't know. I was unable to move the... Um... Let me let me see if it's here or not. You have it open. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I have it open. No. Okay. Also, is it possible for me to switch around the slide? Um... I said three and four. Yeah. 
So you want three to be four and four to be three? Yeah. Okay, hey, how you guys doing? And is uh, number one your title slide? Yeah. Joe, you good to go? Yeah, I'm good. You Mark? Listen. Good? Yep. Marson, you good? Okay. Yep. All right. Whenever you're ready, Cedric. Okay, hang on a second. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, your picture looks better than my picture. I think it worked. Give me, give me just a couple more seconds. Go. That's because I, I just went and grabbed it off the uh, the web right before this meeting, and I couldn't find <laughs> remember where I downloaded it from. Okay. Uh, the public affairs office puts them out there. There's all kinds of them. Oh, that's good. I like that one. This was actually, my, I took this at the Wake Forest game in 2004 from my season ticket seats. There you go. All right, let me get control here. So, Catherine, the slide is not up here. Yeah, hang on just a sec. I don't know what okay. happened. Um, but we are going to have a momentary disruption in, can you guys see okay now? Yeah. Okay, excellent. We have a momentary disruption. Um, there was a, a hanging chad setting, so to speak, um, that's unfortunately going to pull everybody back into the main session, which is really unfortunate. But I'm just going to throw everybody right back into the breakout rooms and we'll keep going. So that's going to happen in about 10 seconds. Um, and it should be pretty smooth. Uh, Catherine, can you set us longer time periods for the breakout session? Yep, absolutely. So it just was a hanger on from the last time we were, we were in here. So um, I'm going to actually just take that off entirely. Um, and yeah, okay. Hey, Catherine, when we're done in our breakout rooms, are we coming back to the main room after, or are we we're, done? We're, Jed, we're getting kicked out of the breakout rooms now. <laughs> we're no, just going to put everybody right back in again. Sorry about that. That was just a, an odd hanging on uh, little setting. So I'm just going to put everybody right back okay, in. Okay, okay, great. Sorry for the disruption. Okay. No, Jed, you're not coming back. Okay. okay thanks, John. All right, here we go. Thank you. All right, I think most people are headed back into the rooms they were in. Again, so sorry about that. Um, however, I think we are good to go. I'm gonna give you control, Cedric. Okay. Um, if you go ahead and click the screen, um, you should see the little buttons pop up and then you can go ahead and control and move ahead one. Okay. I'll start when you're ready, Cedric, go ahead. Yeah, I'm pressing the button, but it's not moving forward. All right, let's try this again. Technology is great when it works. All right, I just uh, reset it. Try it one more time. Go ahead and click the, the main screen and some uh, watermark buttons in the lower left corner should pop up. And if they don't, I can go ahead and just advance this, the slides for you. Catherine, all we see is breakout room number four. Yeah, I, I have my cursor underneath the TEC, but it's not popping up. That's yeah. okay, you can move forward. I'll do a snap. <laughs> <laughs> now we have no screen. <laughs> this is I think when everybody came back into the rooms, it just uh, threw some things off. So here we go. One more time with feeling. Uh, I think the snap had feeling. I was impressed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got it now. Okay. Uh, We're back in business. Thank you so much for your patience. No worries. All right, you ready, John? Yep. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Cedric Vargas. I'm the founder of Ten Ease. We are a premium sneaker rental company. You can think of us as Rent the Runway, but instead of renting out dresses to young businesswomen, we rent out sneakers to today's sneaker enthusiasts. Why? Because sneaker enthusiasts are crazy about wearing out today's hottest sneakers. So much so that they'll wait days, if not weeks ahead, just to be able to get the latest pair of Nikes or Adidas. And this happens every single week. That is why the sneaker resale market right now is worth $2 billion and it is expected to triple in size by 2025 to $6 billion. Right now, if you wanted to get a pair of sneakers, you can go to uh, one of these stores. You can go to sneaker 
resale stores like round two, you can go to sneaker retail stores like Foot Locker or Nike, or you can go to secondary marketplaces like StockX. However, with all of these companies, you don't have all of the following quick delivery, hype assortment, low cost, and upkeep. But you know what company does? Tenies. We allow you to look like a 10 out of 10 with ease. And the process for you to look like a 10 out of 10 with ease is also pretty great. It's as simple as rent, rock, and return. All you have to do is go onto our website, tennies.com, look at our inventory of sneakers, choose the sneaker you want for the size and the duration you want for, click the date, click reserve, and then within three days, you get your sneaker with a return label. So when you're ready, you can just return it back to us. For us to make money, well, there's a three-pronged process. First, we buy the sneakers. On average, we believe it would cost us about $400 to buy each pair of sneakers. This includes $25 per sneaker for maintenance and storage. Then we lend it out through two different programs, through the rental-based program, like how Rent the Runway does it. So a four-day rental or an eight-day rental. We also plan on launching a subscription-based model where there's a rotation program. So when you get tired of one sneaker, you send it back and we send you another one. We also believe that we would be able to get $350 for each sneaker resale. Now, the reason why we believe we will be able to get that much money is because we know how to professionally clean, disinfect, and prep our sneakers. So when you wear them out, not only are they water and stain resistant, but we put crease protectors to make sure that they do not crease. So they essentially always look like a 10 out of 10. Um, for us, for that, in, or, in order for that to work, we would need a lot of customers. So for us to get those customers, we have um, a customer acquisition uh, strategy. First, we are starting to mass produce our content for Instagram and Facebook. We've started to acquire brand ambassadors to wear out our sneakers and new posts for us. But we also plan on doing paid ads on Instagram and Facebook where there's already sneakerhead groups. That would give us a customer acquisition cost of roughly $175. We believe that our lifetime value of each customer would be roughly $700 with four rentals and being on a subscription-based model for four months. That would give us an LTV CAC ratio of four. However, the lifetime value of each customer takes a while for us to get that value, which is why we believe that we would break even in around year two and by year five, make $62 million in profit. That is with us having 60,000 people in the subscription-based model, 50,000 rentals, and having 200,000 sneakers total in our inventory. How we plan on acquiring that inventory is by going to sneaker conferences like SneakerCon, which is the world's largest sneaker store, going, uh, having an inventory acquisition team, which we have already started to build out, whose primary focus is to not only acquire the sneakers, but get them for retail, and partnering up with a sneaker resale shop, which we're in the process of doing. In order for this to be an amazing company, we need an amazing team, which we're already starting to create. We have me, Cedric Vargas as the founder and CEO, Johnny, who's in charge of backend development, Benoit, who's our CTO in charge of all things tech, Divya, web development, Max, inventory acquisition, Emily, business strategy, and Maxime on marketing. We want to pair everybody in our team with in somebody on the advisory board. So we're looking for people who have experience in rentals, marketing, supply chain management, and legal. We are also looking for an investment of $250,000. This would allow us to prove out our proof of concept even more than what we have already. Uh, already having nine customers in different parts within the United States pre-COVID. This would allow us uh, to get 625 sneakers, 150 subscribers, and 650 rentals. Again, my name is Cedric Vargas. I am the founder of 10 Ease. You can follow us on any of the social medias. You can use that QR code to go to our website. We are at Rent 10 Ease. You can email me at cedricvargas at 10 Ease.com. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. I'll take any questions now. Great job, Cedric. Um, I'm not exactly what people would call a fashionista, <laughs> but um, I, I do like your idea of rental sneakers. But I gotta believe that if someone wants to rent, let's say the new Nike Bauhaus sneakers that are gonna be coming out, they're gonna want them like when they first come out and they might be hot for like a few weeks, maybe a month. And then they're gonna kind of been has-beens. Everyone's kind of had them, let's go get to the new ones. How are you going to make sure that for the week or two or maybe month that these sneakers are so hot, you're going to be able to maximize the rentals? Because it seems like after a month or two, people are going to be like, oh, yeah, that's that's old fashioned, even if it's just a couple months old. Yeah, so it, it all depends on the sneaker that we get. So, for instance, we have a sneaker on our website 
the Travis Scott sixes, uh, which I usually have in, in the presentations. And those not have only held their value and their popularity, but have risen in value since then. Um, but you're, you're right. It, in the beginning, there's a lot of hype around each sneaker release. So the plan is for us to have the, our inventory acquisition team going and getting the sneaker at retail when it first comes out. And then when they do release the resale is like, there's a lot of sneakers that are go on resale. So we would be able to acquire them. Um, and then for them to go out and be rented out, uh, one idea that we were having was having a pre-rental. So like, let's say it's coming out soon and we don't have it in stock right now. We know which sneakers we need to go after and in what sizes. So that way people can have them for when we do end up getting them in. Are you operating already? Do you have, do you have revenue? Yeah, um, we have had nine rentals. We have tennies.com. You can go on right now. Uh, it's a live website. Um, yeah. And, and, how, uh, and how are you marketing now? So all of the, all the rentals we've gotten thus far have been just from, we, we did posters on, um, we posted them up on Milwaukee Avenue where there's a couple of sneaker resale stores. Um, but we've had rentals in Texas and in New York. So a lot of this has just been people going in, typing sneaker rental. And then if you look us up on Google, I think we're like the third listing. Um, but right now we realize that that's like bad. So we're starting to do mass media content for our social medias and we're finding brand ambassadors. So that way, once COVID is done, people know that we exist. It's Marcin. Uh, you're actually number two for uh, sneaker rental. So that's pretty cool. Uh, just, Google, just Googled that. Uh, quick question. How'd you come up with uh, four and eight on the rental days? Uh, I, I would think that people would wear, wear it once or a lot. And how do you come up with four and eight? Yeah, so we tried looking at how Rent the Runway has been able to be so successful. And so what how they rent out their dresses and is four and eight. And the reason why it's four and eight, is, I'm guessing, but originally we did weekend and week rentals and weekends are three days and then uh, weeks are seven, but then you add the extra day just in case for the shipping. Yeah. Um, Cedric, how are you gonna be able to deal with multiple sizes? I mean, I'm assuming just the, between the three judges who've asked questions, you know, we'll all have different size feet. <laughs> Um, how yeah. are you going to have such a range of not only to get the hot and cool sneakers, but to also have them in the size that the people will want to rent? I mean, I'm a size nine. I'm lucky because it's like this pretty standard size. But I would think, you know, someone who's got like a size 11 or 13 might be a little bit more challenging. Yeah. Uh, so I've talked to a couple of mentors. And one thing that we were planning on doing right now was focusing on three main sizes. So eight, nine and 10, which are the most popular uh, shoe sizes right now. But as we move forward, the plan is to have um, only full sizes. And then we have sneaker inserts that you can put in the front of your shoe that are really comfy. I've worn them out multiple times and they uh, give you a full size. So if you're a size seven, um, you can wear a size eight shoe as part of our inventory. Any more questions? Yeah, Mark, yeah. go ahead. I'll take one more. Okay. So uh, the team that you put together, um, what are you guys doing this summer? Are they all working with you on this? Well, yeah. So that, that's another thing that we would have as an ask. If you guys know of any other opportunities for us, please let us know. We've uh, applied for the Polsky Accelerator Program. We are on the wait list right now. Um, and so we, the plan is the, most of the tech team already has internships, so they'll be working part-time. But the rest of the team, especially the people within uh, Polsky, will be working uh, with this full-time if we have an accelerator program. If not, it would be part-time. How many of your team will be full-time if, if you get in the accelerator? Four people. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're done. Judges, take one minute, please. Let me know when you're ready to go and we'll move on to the next team. All right, Marson's good. Okay. And peers, let me remind you, it's it's really um, 
your comments are, are completely different way you look at things. You um, be gracious and give just um, even just a little feedback is much appreciated by everybody. And if you do it, um, other people do it for you and we'll have a great learning experience from the evening. So please, please take some time to fill it out as well. I'm good to go, John, whenever you Okay. Agreed. All right, there we go. Autumn. Hello, can everyone hear me? We can. Awesome, awesome. Can you advance the slides? I think so. Yes. Okay, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I'm Mike. I'm the CEO of Autumn. So let's first talk about the problem. So last summer, this was my, this was my schedule. So I had a lot of different events and tasks that I wanted to do throughout the day. And it was just all chunked there, very disorganized. And so the main problem is just many tasks with such a tight schedule. And I know a lot of students, uh, especially on my campus, where their schedules and this schedule doesn't look exactly different. It's crazy. So what Autumn does is that it's a, uh, it's a scheduling application. And so it schedules projects and tasks using AI. And so here's a little prototype right here. We're currently still developing the prototype and this is what one of them looks like. And so our value proposition is Autumn aided success. And so what the app does is that it remembers and takes initiative on these projects and tasks. So a lot of people who have problems with procrastination, this is something for them. And since it has this machine learning algorithm, it improves with the user. So the more someone gets tasks done, the more uh, flexible the user becomes and the better the machine learning algorithm becomes as well. And also this has integration with current calendar and to-do list type applications. So for example, if you use Google Calendar or Outlook as well as Todoist, it would be able to take the tasks from Todoist as well as Google Calendar and find out the best time for you to work on, uh, to work on those tasks. It's also free and easy to use. And so, uh, there we go. So who are our customer segments? As I discussed before, it's college students, more specifically um, students who go to American universities that are in STEM and business. So really like type A, go-getter, ambitious students who already use a Google Calendar type app as well as a uh, to-do list type app. And so some statistics show that um, about 80% of mobile users all have at least one productivity app. And the productivity genre has risen from 11th to 9th since 2018. So it's in the top 10. So it's a very big and growing market. And so our, currently our total market segment by the, year, by the end of year two, which is when we would uh, release the iOS application would be about 5.7 billion. <clears throat> so our revenue model uh, since it's free, we'll have to be making money through banner interstitial inter as well as native ads and data sales. So we wouldn't be able to make any money through data sales until approximately year two. So we calculated that by the end of it. And so we used, um, so we used different ratios like the click through ratio, the click to install and the average retention of users for an app that's directed towards them. And these are the calculations that we came up with, about $1.10 per user per day, active user. And so for the financial projections, what we would need is a $150,000 investment for advertising because small businesses for applications, they average around $15,000 to $20,000 a month for advertising. So that's what we would need. And so we have a predicted about $42 million in retained earnings over the seven years based on the market penetration of about 0.5% by the end of year seven. And so our competition, our main competition would be uh, the scheduling applications as well as the to-do list applications. And so we try to accommodate this through the ability to, um, to use uh, other scheduling and to-do list applications within our app. So our app is more of like a toolbox rather than its own sort of thing. So there are no other apps that do this uh, that integrate with other scheduling and to-do list applications. So we would 
not have any competition on that front. So it would just be getting users to, town, to download this and use it. So, I'm sorry. It's, so here's our team. Uh, as I said before, I'm Mike. I'm a C. I'm the CEO. We have Daniel, who's the COO, Anushka, the CTO, Shruti, the product manager, and Aditi, the software developer. And you can see by our majors, and I could talk more about our interests later, but we are all perfectly fit for the roles that we are currently in. And here is a screen. Oh. And also, as a, in terms of our current status and milestones, we finished customer discovery. And so what we discovered is that 90% of uh, students said that um, time management is the most important thing to be successful. And as well as 80% said it's the first uh, most important thing. And about uh, another 80% said that the one thing that they would need to work on is procrastination, which is why we're building this application. And here's a screenshot from our website. You can contact us with uh, automap at gmail.com and take a look at that. Thank you. Okay, Michael, thanks. Judges, questions, uh, Michael, recommendations? Michael, can you describe just in a little bit more detail how you solve the procrastination problem? So basically, if I have my calendar and Google Calendar, how, do, how does that get from there to the AI engine to procrastination solved? They didn't quite get that. Sure, sure. So uh, it's a little blurry, but from the use case diagram. So essentially what happens is that um, the user connects both their to-do list applications. So they're basically their tasks that they wanna do. They have a deadline for those tasks. And the app, uh, within the app, the app figures out um, the best times for those tasks to be done based on their current schedule. So it, uh, to begin with, it'll have some sort of um, just general uh, algorithm for it, but then it adapts with the user. Uh, does that answer your question? It starts to, it's more like when you say adapt to the user, I mean, how are you going to get all the information needed to adapt? Uh, so all we would need is just their current schedule as well as um, what tasks they want to get done. And it'll have, we'll have some sort of baseline for which tasks that the algorithm would implement first. And then eventually, as the user continues to use the app, the, the app would um, recognize when certain tasks are best done so that the app could realize that 8 p.m. on Thursdays is an excellent time to get a certain task done. Okay. Okay. Move? Michael, go ahead. Go on. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So, Michael, if I'm a procrastinator and I basically don't get around to putting the tasks online, and my calendar only has those things that people send me, and I really, I know I got the afternoon free, and I know I got like a half dozen things I have to do, but I don't write them down. Where do you get, where can you pull the information? Are you going to scan email? Are you going to figure out it from anywhere else? Just trying to figure out, again, as Joe's looking, how do you get over the hump of someone being a procrastinator? Um, well, we're looking more towards uh, users that have already taken the initiative to write down their tasks and write down uh, their events. And then eventually we may be able to get the, the heavy procrastinators that don't even have anything on their schedules or tasks. So in terms of someone who doesn't have anything to begin with, uh, it, it's worth just starting. So if um, even if the users had um, maybe one or two events on their calendar and then like just like one or two tasks on their uh, task list, then the app will figure out, we'll still be able to try to figure out when best to work on just those simple tasks. Great, thanks. My question was around uh, your existing calendar. Does it move anything on the actual calendar that you might already have uh -huh. or just add new things? Yeah. So it'll be able to it'll be able to um, detect when something's changed from like Google Calendar, and you'll be able to change stuff within the app as well, or like whatever application you're using. But but does it change anything on the existing schedule to you know push new things in, or does it leave that stuff generally alone? Yeah, it can it can push certain things as long as the user like it, it'll ask the user. Got it. Is okay. this okay? Got it won't it. just start changing around the schedule. Makes sense. Cool. So Mike, if I have a task that I know, like I have to um, pay my bills mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and then and basically I put it in that pay my bills. It will put an entry in my calendar that blocks out time that says this is when you're going to pay your bills. Yes. And then if you don't like the current time that's there, you can change it and the app will learn from that. Okay. Okay. All right. Why don't we end there? We're running a little bit behind. Um, does anybody, judges, let me ask you, or does anybody have a, 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 a urgent desire to uh, have a break here or can we forge along here? We're running a little bit behind. We could take a couple minutes if that works for you guys or keep forging ahead. I'm okay with forging ahead. I'm just going to go grab a water. Same okay. Here. Just 60 seconds. Yeah, let's do 60 seconds. Thanks. 706 and we're back. Catherine, can you advance it? Yeah, thanks. So first line, you want to Get prepared here. Can you go ahead and give me access to the um, to the slides? Sure, Catherine. Can you work on that? Are you able to advance them yet, Sean? I'm still not able to You're advance working them. Working on it now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. About five different things I have to do simultaneously. So. Well, thank you for doing this. Oh, of course, of course. I want to let you guys all know that if it wasn't for Catherine, this would this whole event would be a complete disaster because none of the rest of us are qualified. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, LaShawn, by chance, are you using an iPad? I'm using an iPhone actually because I couldn't I couldn't get it on the laptop. Got it. Okay, so um, remote access is not going to work that way. So if you're comfortable, um, I'll go ahead and just advance for you um, on on your queue if you're okay. That's cool. Then I'll take up his snapping. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Whistle, <I'll do> it. <laughs> All right. Let me, Joe, Marcin. Let me know when you're back and and Joe's. I can see Joe's still yep, offline here. here. Okay, so we'll just wait for Joe and we'll get going. And LaShawn, just um, so you know, I um, the slide deck that you sent, I put your title slide in from the prior. Uh, okay, that's perfect then. Um, in the second one, um, I'm going to start off with the second one. Great. Perfect. And you could cl click all the way through it, I guess, to the, to the last one. Perfect. Okay. The one right before the question mark. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I remind peers, please give your fellow students some feedback here. I'm going to go on mute. Uh, so LaShawn, um, if you need me, um, just let me know. Okay. So am I ready? Uh, we're waiting for one more judge, Joe. Just Joe, Joe Jablonski. He'll be back in a second. I'll let you know when. Yep, he's back. Anytime you're ready. All right. So imagine you're a firefighter and you get called to the scene and there's a patient in the elevator trapped. Each and every second is critical with trying to access this patient. So there's a couple of barriers that you have to face as far as where are the keys, where is the management, how to actually contact management, and where are the utility shutoffs. So each and every day, firefighters face the same situation. That's why we came up with First Line. Next slide, please. First Line, who, sorry, first of all, who am I? Um, my name is LaShawn James and I'm a firefighter. And I'm also the founder of First Line. First Line is an app designed for firefighters to help them in the event of an emergency event. First Line actually puts together three different groups, insurance companies, firefighters, and business owners. Um, the pain points we're trying to handle are insurance companies have a lot of liability as it relates to fire, um, fires, fire, fire, fire situations. Firefighters don't have enough information on the scene to actually deal with the various uh, to deal with the various scenes that we have to deal with and business owners actually 
pay a lot for their insurance. So we actually trying to address those things by actually putting all those partners together and, um, and going into to address this issue. Uh, next, next page. And you could go ahead and click on that for me. Click through and two more, thank you. And so some of the pain, I'm sorry, back out on the next one. Yes, so, so business owners will input information into the system. I don't, if you guys have ever heard of um, Snapshot, basically we're gonna be the, the snapshot for business owners. So just like you get a discount on your car insurance from the insurance company, you're gonna get a discount from your um, business policy from the insurance company by participating with first line and first line would then act as a conduit for the, the fire fire department and the firefighters on the scene. So each and every, um, each and every person would actually win in this scenario. Business owners would actually receive a reduction in their rate. Insurance company will reduce their and reduce their liability and risk for fires and uh, any other scenarios that happen where emergency responders will have to come out. And then firefighters would then receive their information on the scene to actually get uh, reduce their uh, liability um, for obtaining that patient and being able to have that real time information that they need on the scene. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, our financial breakdown, we're actually going to be uh, relying on all the companies that you see on, uh, ahead. We're relying on all of them to actually participate in this program. Um, currently, um, right now, our fire department that we actually participate in, um, which is a good reason for why we need this, COVID-19, we can't actually go in businesses and do our, um, our tour or do our walkthrough. So we, we can't actually obtain the information that we need right now due to COVID-19. So by um, participating with the business owners to actually update this information, we then will get that real-time information from them and it would always stay updated as we would do a regular general inspection of their facility, as far as their alarms, their um, fire smoke detectors, their shutoffs, their emergency exits, and we would get all that information from the business owner and they would participate in this and they would be active participants as well as the fire department can then uh, work directly with them. And then we go to the next page. And then first line, we're also looking for developers. So if you ask, if you're interested in uh, working with us and working with the fire department on trying to save, save and change lives. So we say first line, save time, save money, save lives with first line. And you could contact us at firstline247 at gmail.com. Thank you. Hello, Sean, so it's Marcin here. Um, what, what kind of information is helpful. I, that wasn't clear to me during the presentation. Like, as, as what what do the insurance companies want? So, insurance companies currently, for um, for residential or say, for instance, you have a six unit building or a twelve unit building, they want to know um, when your um, first um, like what's your um, fire extinguisher? When the last time you had it serviced? So each and every year you have to get it serviced and you have to send them a photo. So. Currently, the insurance companies hold some of this information and the fire department holds separate information as well. Then they want to know, like, when the last time you service your, um, your smoke detectors, because the smoke detector lasts five to seven years. And so smoke detectors, the carbon monoxide detectors, they want to know if you got an emergency exit in your building. Uh, if you have a fire pump or a fire panel, you need to get a service every year. And if you have a kitchen if, as a restaurant, you got to get it serviced every year. So these are the things that the insurance companies are looking for to reduce that risk. And these are the things that we'll be working with the insurance company with and then providing this information directly to the fire departments. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me ask you a question just a little bit differently. I think there's two things <clears throat> that you're looking at. One is compliance where you're looking at the business and, and, and doing compliance with smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. And then the second thing I think you're proposing is, um, is that firefighters that having more information can help reduce the cost of a damage or something. Can, can you explain to me how, how you, as a firefighter, how if you had more information, you could potentially save lives or, or, or property? Okay, just as I stated in the initial um, example, almost like if I have a patient that's locked in the elevator. So if I know exactly where the key box is on the building, um, the exact location of it using the app, 
then now that saves me time. So I won't have an injured person or a person that die in that particular building because I would get to them in time by being able to provide them the BLS or ALS um, CPR that's needed for them to not die on that particular um, at that particular location. So that would actually save the insurance company by not having uh, a lawsuit as a result of this person being uh, trapped on the elevator. Cool. And then other things would be like the shut off for the elevator, like how to shut down the elevator, the pump panels and other information that we need to, to make real time decisions. Have you talked to any insurance companies yet? Have you gotten any insurance companies interested? Right now, so far, me and Ken had meetings right before um, everything happened with COVID. Um, we had a couple of meetings with um, two insurance executives for their public safety and public sector um, departments. But we did meet with uh, numerous buildings, building owners and uh, developers to uh, see if they would participate. So first, LaShawn, thank you very much for your service. I mean, being a firefighter is a tough job, so I appreciate the, the work of that. Um, let's assume that people put the information in first line. How do you anticipate a firefighter who's arriving on a scene will know, oh my God, this is a first line building and access that information. Where would they, where'd they go? Is this something that would come to them on the truck as they're driving over? Is it something they need to look up? How do you expect them to get it? So right now we have, um, we have iPads and all our, our engines and all of our apparatus. So we can actually access it from the iPad, downloading the app location. And then we can also, we also sometimes have our cell phones as well. So if we wanted who's ever in the back, which is the firefighter, you know, the engineer drives and then the lieutenant is in the vehicle at all times. So whoever is the back person who navigates like what streets you go down, they would actually look that information up and give everyone updates on where everything is. So they would go to your firstline.com website and pull it up from there. They would, yeah, they would access the app. We ha we currently have apps right now that we use for the fire department. There's a couple of them that show you exactly what streets um, something, uh, what streets a fire on, or what street um, a person is having um, who need uh, they need CPR. It's currently apps being developed right now where people are actually adopting in that. And I mean, I've looked at a lot, a ton of firefighters so far have about three to four apps related to information with firefighters and uh, emergency events. Great, thank you. Okay, we've got about 10 seconds. So why don't we end it there, judges, if you would spend a few minutes and peers filling out your sheets and let me know when you're ready to go. And we'll move on to the next team. Can everyone hear us? We can. Awesome. Oh, okay. It give takes it just, just, just give oh. it a minute. Give it a minute. Judges will give me a thumbs up and we'll go from there. Parsons, good. Gotcha. I'm good, John. Okay, Mark. And Marson, where in the world are you right now? Uh, sunny Vale, uh, California, okay, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my sweatpants. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know if you were overseas or if you were in California or where. Are you, uh, are you good, Joe? No, no. Oh, you're on mute, so good, good to go. All right. Sorry, karma trade. Go. Um, it takes 22 and a half bathtubs full of water to create one pair of jeans. I'm going to repeat that. It takes 22 and a half bathtubs full of water to create just one pair of jeans. This water goes to growing cotton, sewing and transporting the cotton, and most important of all, dyeing the cotton. And this is what happens when you dye too much cotton. What you're looking at is the pollution from cotton plants um, in different areas. 
what happens is this pollution poisons the people, the animals, and the plants in the area causing negative generational effects. And this is just a snapshot of the fast fashion industry. And the fast fashion industry is just, is the second most polluting industry in the world, right behind the oil industry. And this is because we operate in a linear economy. So what happens in a linear economy? Well, you consume, you produce things at mass rates and then dispose them. Let's take fashion, for example. Every year we create 80 billion new items. And keep in mind, just one of those items takes 22 and a half bathtubs just to create. And yet we're still throwing away 250 million tons of textile waste. So this problem has gone on for too long and the only solution is a circular model. Let's take the clothes that were designated to waste and then if we can plug them back into the supply chain, back into the consumer space, then they can have, then we can prevent one, producing new clothes and also textile waste. Hi, my name is Mona. And my name is Igor. Oh, we trying to go back. How do we go school. back? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so introducing karma trade, we're combating the negative, the unsustainable clothing production costs as well as textile waste. We're a B2C zero waste clothing swap service that allows people to swap their, uh, clean out their closets as well as rejuvenate their style. How do you do this? Well, we have an easy three step process. The first step is you upload a picture, you upload pictures of the clothes that you don't wear to our platform. A team member on our side evaluates it for points and tells you how many points you can get. Step two, you can choose the items that you want from our platform, fill it up in your car and check out what the points we gave you. You can receive your items as soon as you pay us a small service fee to be able to cover our costs. Step three, it's swap time. So once you get your clothes, you can try it on, keep what you like, and then swap in the clothes you had initially in your picture. Because we're a zero waste initiative, we want you to, um, we want you to reuse the same box that we shipped to you. Now, Wait, over, the, over the past month, right, so um, <laughs> our, target, our target audience are people with unsold merchandise listings on secondhand clothing swap services or just secondhand clothing retailers. Um, why are they going to switch to Karma Trade? It's because on those uh, services, you have slow sales. So you have to actually wait for people to want your clothes to buy them from you, then you get value from your clothes. In Karma Trade, we will immediately give you value for your clothes as soon as you upload the pictures to us. For the other clothing, uh, for the other retailers, um, you have to pay, t uh, let's say you're trying to sell 10 items, you have to pay 10 different shipping fees. With Karma Trade, you send all your clothes in in one go and only pay one shipping fee, so you get more of your value from your clothes. And finally, just consignment shops are picky. They might not take your clothes. Um, in an interview with a past customer, she told us that she only came to us because uh, Plato's Closet didn't take her clothes and she got a lot of value for her clothes. That's why they're gonna uh, swap to us. Our goal for um, this year is to hire 10 full-time workers operating out of one warehouse. And in order to do this, we are creating an online platform to, to have our online swap functionality as well as to connect it to the warehouse with um, warehouse optimization strategies. Now, um, over the month before uh, the coronavirus happened, we had 80 swaps running two events a week for four weeks. Extrapolating that out to a year, that'd be 960 swaps per year uh, with no marketing, no equipment, and no real warehouse. Our potential with a warehouse and workers is 144,000 swaps per year at just one fourth the efficiency of Amazon. And the potential is just growing because there's 15 million users on these other secondhand platforms. And we know that we can deliver a better service as long as we can handle the operations and have a more efficient strategy. So let's look at the impact that we can make. So remember that statistic on 22 and a half bathtubs of water to create one item? Well, we know that in every swap, we can, uh, we typically have 10 people uh, sorry, 10 items swapped in. So extrapolating that, that means if we're operating at maximum capacity in the first year, we can save 32.4 million bathtubs of water. 
That's almost 4,000 Olympic pools. And year two will reinvest into the business with the sales and uh, be able to make even greater impact. That's 48.6 million bathtubs and almost 6,000 Olympic pools of fresh water. So how are we doing this? The okay, we're gonna have, this. You're going to have to wrap up pretty fast here. 10 seconds. Sure. So this is our team. Um, without them, wouldn't be talking about millions of app tubs. Reach, us out, reach out to us on these platforms and happy swapping. Thanks for listening to us. Very good. Nice job, guys. <laughs> All right, judges. So I'll go first. Um, so are you guys basically maintaining the inventory? And, and I didn't, you didn't talk much about how you're going to charge either the end user or can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So in our uh, local operation, we charge people with a service fee that was anywhere from $5 to $10. Um, similarly, we're going to implement that on our online platform plus a shipping fee, but they get to do larger bulk items for each job. The more items you have in the cart, the more you have to pay a service fee for. Right. Got it. So, so as a as a typical user who has say you know three or four pairs of jeans here that I never wear, like what would my experience be? Do I I, I go on your your website and basically say, hey, here here they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we'll evaluate it for points, and then um, we don't charge you anything during that free evaluation process. So you can decide if you want to keep it or um, trade it in. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I thought I was muted before. So let me just go back to this. You basically, I, I, let's use Martin's example. It's got four pair of jeans. I, I've got four pair of jeans in my closet. I'm going to take pictures, put them up there, and you say, hey, congratulations. You get 45 points. Great. So I can go online. I could swap for a few things, get a T-shirt, get a jacket, something like that, find 45 points, pay you $10 and a shipping fee, and we swap them? Mm -hmm. Yep. And for the $10 and the shipping fee, so let's assume your shipping fee covers the shipping to you and you're shipping to me. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to do all that swapping for $10 every time? Yeah. Um, so the more clothes you send in. Storage and stuff? Um, yeah. So um, we actually worked it out. So it's we earn uh, $2.50 per swap. Um, no matter how many clothes you swap. And since we're getting the clothes and we're giving you points for the clothes, um, we don't, it doesn't matter to us necessarily how many points the clothes cost. It only matters the service fee and the service fee um, actually does cover all of our operational expenses. Um, and it actually does cover actually four times all the other expenses in a marketing budget. Hmm. Think about like Amazon warehousing. Um, that's, that's the strategies and um, warehouse efficient like operation structures we're looking at. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. All right, great job, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, one more to go here. We're on the home stretch. Judges, I'll give you one minute and then we'll get the Gem Power Girls. Let me know when you're ready to go. I'm ready. Okay. Same here. All right. And I'm the slow one this time, bringing up the rear. You good? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Are you able to control the slides? Um, no, the slides aren't up. No, all we see is the breakout room for uh, agenda. Yeah, so the um, I gave you control, Fernando, so you should be able to uh, move the slide deck along. 
There you go. Whenever you're ready, Fernando. Okay, thanks. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Fernie Orozco. Today I'm presenting Gem Power Girls, a mobile app and hardware hybrid learning platform um, developed for girls with STEM career aspirations. This is the team behind Gem Power Girls. We met as grad students at the University of Illinois at Chicago and started submitting this project to um, startup competitions at, at our university. The, the idea for Gem Power Girls came to, to me seeing my, my niece, Azaria. Um, she usually had an, an iPad or a smartphone in one hand and, and a toy in the other, a toy being a super performance vehicle or a rocket of, of some sort. So myself being, being her uncle and having an, an educational researcher and educational policy background, I wanted to, to bridge these two worlds for her, bridge the, um, the, the hardware and the digital um, platforms for, for her. And, and so this, what you're seeing is the is the user face that I had came up came up with. So what what you how you do this is with a particular technology called tangible tangible plastics. Um, this technology was developed by a team um, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. They were able to create a plastic that interacts with the user face of of tablets and smartphones. So my idea is to use this technology in, in what would be um, kind of toys of the future. These are just some, some facts in, in my research of using this type of technology and hands-on learning on um, what we will be invested in is having them scaled learning targets for our use users being being the children. Uh, again, um, so the 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 team at UW Madison, they end up founding uh, a company called um, snowshoe stamps and with 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 the with, the, with their type of plastics, um, they would be able to interact with the user face. So kind of our, our idea is, and just to make it real simple, is say you have um, kind of these kind of super performance vehicles you see at the supermarket, um, Hot Wheels or, or other, other toy brands. And, and our idea is to have these, these um, toys have the added value of this technology, as well as scaled learning targets um, wrapped up in kind of a, a marketing campaign that these these girls can relate to, and that's to us in our idea. That's currently what you don't have on the market right now. So um, when you come, when you look at the market of, of, of children's and games and toys, um, what you have is a digital side and a traditional side. On the traditional side, you have Hasbro, Mattel, and on the digital side, you have Microsoft, Nintendo, and, and Sony Corporation. Um, it's a $46 billion market. These are the major players. Um, and, and they do invest in this kind of hybrid technology that does bridge the digital with the techno, that does bridge the um, digital with, with, with hardware platforms. Um, however, we feel we, 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 there's an op opening when it comes to marketing towards this specific demographic.
um, our, our, rev our revenue stream would come um, mainly from the sale of, of the plastic hardware. So thank you, and, and that was my presentation of Gem Power Girls. All right. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, can you explain a little bit better how the plastic interacts with the app? I didn't quite understand that. It's a uh, sure I can. Um, it's you you take so the the company their name is called I believe Snowshoe Stamps. And you would hold up in you would hold up in one hand the tablet, and in the other hand you would have the the hardware um, toy. So say it is like a rocket, and you would um, touch the toy to the the interface of the tablet or phone. So they call it stamps. So because you're basically stamping their imprint on, on the interface, and our idea is that would then prompt a video um, that will come up. So that video will have like our idea of what's a entertaining type narrative for the user, a storyline um, also with um, learning targets. And how does that help to teach kids or girls computer science? Say, um, it, you know, say they're interested in how a super performance vehicle works. Um, what are the engineering um, concepts behind, you know, the motor and the engine and um, turning, you know, fuel into energy? So the video short would kind of pique their interest in that and and ha explain that in in a kind of a story plot type of way. Cool. So Fernie, are you expecting that the uh, video shorts to pop up, they will be um, aimed towards uh, girls taught by women so they can begin to self-identify that this is something we could do when we get older? Yeah, definitely. Um, you, you know, he's take my niece again, Azaria. So I, I would, you know, picture her at the supermarket with her parents and, and the kind of marketing that we have planned, these, these kind of toys would pop out from your traditional toys aimed at boys. Cool. All right. Going once, going twice. Any more questions? Okay. All right. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fernie. Yeah. So, uh, judges, why don't I give you 30 seconds or a minute? We're running a little bit over here. And then uh, when you're done with your um, sheets there, if you have any last minute comments for the teams, that'd be great. And then we'll wrap it up from there. Mark, you're in Champaign and you're in Chicago, you know. Yeah, story of my life. I'm I'm back in Chicago, but I'm really down in Florida the whole time. <laughs> are you in Florida now? Is that was that? Yeah, we yeah. We were down here for, um, you know, was, uh, basically early spring break, and we just ended up staying. You know, I was there last week, and uh, I tried to convince my wife to stay, and failed. Um, so <laughs> we came back to Chicago. All right, you guys all ready? All set. So uh, who wants to go first? Just a couple of comments for the teams would be great. Joe, you want to take a shot at it and go first? Um, for all the teams in general, I, I think, uh, honestly, I've been doing this for a long time. And I think in general, this is some of the better uh, uh, business plans I've seen in a while. Um, I, I think uh, in particular, uh, what I liked in a few things is uh, um, some really good double bottom line businesses with uh, with Carly Trade, First Line, uh, uh, and Equability um, really are, are good and uh, some pretty well developed business plans. All right, awesome, thank you. 
Mark or Marcin, you wanna, who wants to go next? Marcin, you wanna go next? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage to come up here and, and do this. So uh, congrats to everybody that, that's uh, been able to do that. And I know it's not easy to do it on Zoom as well. Um, so I know slides and stuff were, were out of order. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't, don't stress too much tonight. Um, what, what was really helpful for me and I would encourage, uh, you guys to just reflect on is it, it's good to see real world examples of the business out there already. Um, so, you know, a good example of that was, uh, Tenny's just how many rentals so far, uh, karma trade, you know, how many swaps so far seeing that, uh, really makes it a reality. Um, so even if it's not an impressive number, just showing good examples of that, I think is, is super helpful. And I would encourage, you know, should you go on and present your slides to somebody else, having that in there would be really helpful. That's my biggest takeaway from this, I think. Awesome, great advice. Yeah, Mark, Mark. I'm following Marston's footsteps. I, the thing I saw here that I have not seen before in a lot of other business plan competition um, teams is that they've already got results. I think going out, there, having a cause is great. But going out there and, and doing customer discovery is even better. But going out and actually starting to turn revenue because you're actually executing on the business, you're going to learn a ton and you're going to get quick feedback of what's working and not working. I was thrilled to see that um, some of the teams were off and generating revenue. The amount of revenue is not as relevant as actually getting paid to do something. So I would encourage all the teams you know, to just get out there and start putting your ideas to work seeing what sticks, seeing what people are willing to pay for, and then iterate, iterate, and iterate. This is one of these things you want to fail fast and fail often, but fail cheaply so you can stay alive. Awesome. So Catherine, you want to, can you remove the slides so we can see everybody's face here for a minute? Great, fantastic. So on, on behalf of myself and Catherine and, and certainly Jed uh, and, uh, Steph and um, as well as uh, who else, Harley. Um, we certainly want to thank you, judges, particularly the judges, for um, you know taking the opportunity to come and, and um, coach the students. I think everybody kind of appreciate appreciates it you know, to a great great deal, um, students. So let me let me see you do a little round of applause here, or hands, or whatever you bring, bring yourselves back on video here for just a minute. I got my little hand thing here, so I, you got my hand thing here. There you go. <laughs> There you go. And students, I, I do want to congratulate you. I think Marcin said it well. You know, it takes a lot of guts to do this, uh, particularly over Zoom. I don't know that I'd feel particularly comfortable doing it. So congratulations to you all. Uh, I, I think it was a lot of, I had, I had a lot of fun and hopefully you learned a lot from it. So with that, I will say thank you to everyone. Um, nice job. Um, stay safe. Um, be careful and uh, enjoy the rest of the semester here. I know you guys got a couple more weeks left. Finish strong. I know it's not not easy taking classes online, but um, hopefully, uh, you know, we're one day closer to the end of this thing. So all the best to you all. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, judges. Well done.